Merry meet. I'm Aislinn. This is Ask Aislinn. Tonight I'm here to talk about the awakening gibbous moon and dream work. And if you're here with me live, you can always drop questions into the comments and I will answer those at the end. And if you are not here live, you can always put questions into the comments and I will answer them in next week's episode. So we have entered the waning gibbous moon. This is the, we are actually on, let's see, about day 18 of our lunar cycle. The waning gibbous lasts from six, day 16 to day 21. So this is the space between the full moon and the last quarter moon. And when we get to this place, it's kind of useful for us to look at how it corresponds to the wheel of the year or just the seasonal shifts that happen that take place around us and it will help give us information about what we can do in the smaller part of the cycle right we have the larger wheel of the year and then we have these smaller lunar cycles within it but they, they correspond in a lot of ways so if we think about the waning gibbous as being aligned to that season of fall, in particular Mabon, so equinox, fall equinox, we can see that this is a good time for feeling grateful, a good time for gratitude. So just like Mabon we sometimes say is the witch's Thanksgiving or the harvest moon of September, we might call the witch's Thanksgiving. We will also look at this point of time in the lunar cycle, the waning gibbous, and turn inward and feel some sense of gratitude. So even if what you desire has not manifested, that energy that we used at the, at the full moon to really bring out that peak manifestation energy, to send that into our desires, even if that desire has not manifested yet, we can still turn inward and we can be grateful for the things that are coming. We don't actually have to have them yet to feel gratitude. So not only is this a great time for gratitude and expressing, you know, thanks to those around us or the gods and the goddesses, but there's also this inkling to start turning inward. So remember, the waning half of the cycle is our, our turning inward part of the cycle. Our energies start to slow down. Some of us experience this as... Um, lack of energy even as we get closer to the end of the cycle but as we start to have that inkling to turn inward we um we start to i guess less of project our energy outward and more think about what's going on internally so this is why near the end of the cycle we love shadow work and we like those kinds of things now, this is a great time of the cycle to cleanse ourselves of negativity. So, as I mentioned, the waning moon is very good for releasing. We will start to feel that amplified releasing energy once we cross last quarter. So, if you're watching this live, we, our last quarter will take place on Saturday. So, once we pass over that point, we're going to start to feel that amplified releasing. But, we're, nevertheless, we're feeling it right now. So, it's a great time to start to... Think about how we're going to cleanse ourselves of any negativity that's around us. Getting rid of unwanted energies. This could be in the house, the space around you. This could also be it internally. And um, it creates for us a release that's a bit, a bit less pronounced. So in a lot of ways, the waning gibbous is good for letting go of things that are going to take some time to release. So, so when we get to that dark moon, you know, those are amplified powerful energy that thing can get released right then but there are things in our lives that are going to take more time than just that quick that quick energy of release and that's why the winning gibbous is so good um not only that we can also release energies from other people it's a really good time for undoing um hexes or curses so especially if you feel that there's been some negative energy that's been sent your way this is a really good time for doing releasings and undoings of that. It's also a good time to do undoings of your own spell work. So if for some reason you did a magical working and afterwards you realized that it wasn't what you wanted or wasn't what you maybe should have done for your higher good, Waning Gibbous is a great time to undo that. Um, now, with that turning inward energy, 
we also start to see dreams be more pronounced in some people. Not everybody. Sometimes people will say their dreams are most pronounced at the full moon and they don't really experience a lot of dreams during the waning, uh, the waning half. But others will say, yeah, they're, they're pretty pronounced at full moon and then they actually can amplify even more. You may find you get more dreams during this, lunar, uh, this half of the lunar cycle than you do in the first half. So I would like to shift focus and spend the rest of the time talking about dreams and how we can work with them, um, you know, especially during the waning gibbous. So I want to start, though, by talking about a few different theories of where, what dreams are, where they come from. Um, hi, Shauna. Shauna's live. Hi. Nice to see you. So there are a couple of explanations. Um, there is the scientific explanation. So I'm going to start with this first. And you're going to see at the end that I kind of feel that all the explanations could all contribute to some kind of overall explanation that we don't necessarily have to choose one or the other of these. So with the scientific explanations, dreams have to do with information processing from this perspective. And they really, what they're trying to do is make sense of the day's events. It could be that they are trying to store memories we only have so much storage space, though there are theories that say that we actually process everything that comes in and maybe we don't necessarily remember it all, but we did store it somewhere. It left an impression somewhere. But you know, other theories say we only have so much space, so therefore the brain has to kind of process what's it going to keep and what's it going to let go of, what's the most important things to carry on. And also kind of processing any input, any learning that was done earlier that day. It's basically from this point of view, dreams are a side effect of that neural activity. And I don't know about you, but I have had a few experiences where I definitely know that I was learning something very difficult. Like last year, I had to help a student with calculus. I hadn't really done calculus since high school or since college. And um, so I was actually having to learn all of this with her, or at least refresh myself on it. And so when I would go to bed at night, sometimes I would dream I would be doing calculus problems, which as a witch, it's really not what I want to be dreaming about. But clearly my mind um, needed that space to work the problems out. And also earlier this year when I was start starting to learn web design to get my website built, I was actually learning a little bit of coding, and so I would notice that I would be moving <laughs> codes uh, in my mind and programming and things like that. And again, from a witch's perspective, I, I found that tedious and not what I wanted to be dreaming about. But clearly, there is, there is something to this scientific explanation that we're processing information during our dreams. But that doesn't mean that just because we accept that as true, that doesn't mean that we can't accept other explanations as well. Um, so I'm going to move to the second theory. So this is also a scientific theory. This is called the activation synthesis theory. And it was developed in the 1970s. It has to do with the idea of electrical stimuli or impulses that are passing through the brain during REM state, the REM state of sleep. And the dreams, therefore, from this perspective, are the brain's way of trying to make sense of this stimuli that's happening outside of um, external stimuli. Like, so something that we see that triggers something in the brain is different than this, this just this electrical stimuli happening when there's nothing going on outside. So dreams are just this way that the brain tries to process that information. For this theory, there is no inherent meaning in dreams. So while I, I, I can get on board a little bit with the processing of electrical stimuli, what I can't get on board with here, this theory, is the no inherent meaning in dreams. And I'm going to guess that most of the people who are following me are on that same page with me. Um, and here I see Malia says dreams very um, vivid. Yeah. Um, very vivid dreams, especially during this time. Um, I've noticed my own dreams, too, getting more and more vivid as we're kind of moving into the waning cycle. So very common. Um, 
So there are also psychoanalytic analytic and psychodynamic explanations of dreams. And we really start here with Sigmund Freud. He said that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. Those of you who have been following me for a while know that I love um, you know, his contemporary Carl Jung. Carl Jung um, said that you know, if, we don't make the, if we don't make the unconscious conscious, it's going to dictate our lives and we're going to perceive that as fate. So this is one reason why we do our shadow work near the end of the month um, or at other times too. But we can also process some of this through our dreams as well. So this really, we need to talk a bit about the three parts of the brain so we sort of understand why we're going to be, we're going to be interpreting dreams in three different ways. So we have the conscious mind, the unconscious mind, and the collective unconscious. And for those who don't know, I'm just going to do a little refresher on these. And the unconscious mind is the, sorry, the conscious mind is that part of us that's operating in the waking world, uh, processing things. I look in the corner, I see my broom is um, against my bookcase with all my books. So this is my conscious mind looking around, processing. I'm here talking to you. I'm processing what I'm saying. Um, you know, looking down at my notes at times. This is all going on in my conscious mind. Now in the un unconscious mind though, we have things that are kind of deep down buried in these layers below the surface. And like an archaeologist, if we want to know what's underneath there, we're going to need to dig down and figure it out. And we've got a lot of ways to do that, and dreams is one way. Now there's also the collective unconscious that we should um, differentiate here. So actually, before I go there, let me just mention one more thing about the, um, the unconscious, the personal unconscious. So in the personal unconscious, we may have some unresolved conflicts or things that have happened in our lives, trauma, various things that we don't remember that were either um, that we didn't process for a reason. A lot of times this would be because the conscious mind didn't believe that we could handle that information or that event or that thing. And so that gets subverted down into the unconscious. And in a moment, when we talk about dream interpretation, we're going to talk about why that's not so great. It, it is a defense mechanism. It, it protects us in the moment. But if we want to evolve spiritually and emotionally, we need to move beyond that. So, um, and I'll give an example too. So I was, when I was in grad school, I was attacked on my way home one night. And I have the space of memory that I, I don't have any memory. It's all blacked out. And um, it basically starts from about 20 minutes before the attack to um, piece, I piece a few things together in the ambulance. And then by the time I'm at the hospital, more memories start to come. But there's this whole space of time. And what's very interesting is during that time when I don't have any memories, the police told me that I actually was able to give a description of the person who attacked me. I was able to give all kinds of information. But all of that get, got blacked out of my memory. So there's a few explanations. One was I did hit my head as I fell, but there's also a reason that the conscious mind might decide that it's too scary, it's too traumatic for this to be a memory and it gets subverted down into the unconscious. So now will that resurface in dreams or in different places? Maybe. But, um, but the point is that kind of shows you how things kind of can get repressed. So a lot of things that get repressed are from a very early age before we're really solidifying memory. Um, but as you can see, I was in my early 20s when this happened. So it can happen well into our adulthood. Um, it can happen at any point in our, in our lives. So the collective uncon unconscious, on the other hand, is different than our personal unconscious. We all share this, and it's something that's shared by the entire species. So the, it's kind of interesting because in a lot of ways it can explain mythological similarities between cultures that had no connection whatsoever for long periods of time, but yet they tend to have these similar myths, similar gods and goddesses. So Carl Jung, who coined this term, he said that it was these people who are writing these myths or coming up with these things are tapping into this kind of invisible field that's around us, that but we're all connected to it through our minds, through that part of our mind, which we call the collective unconscious. So 
I love this story. I told it over the weekend in our new shadow work membership, and I did make a mistake because I said that um, I got the animal wrong. It's actually a monkey and not a bird, but I'm going to tell this story now because I think it's a great explanation of the collective unconscious, and that kind of helps lend a little bit of insight into how our dreams connect to that collective unconscious as well. So in 1952, there was an island called, there, there, there is an island called Koshima, it's off the coast of Japan, I believe, and in 1952, there were these scientists who had gone there to study, the animal was called the Makaka Fuscata, it's a type of monkey. So they're studying this monkey, and remember, the island is very isolated, and it is, has no connections, much connection to the outside world. So they're studying these monkeys, and they saw that these monkeys really liked sweet potatoes. They were giving these monkeys these sweet potatoes. And the potatoes would fall into the sand, and they'd get all covered in sand, and the monkeys would eat them. But as you know, if you've eaten anything that's covered in sand, it's not all that pleasant. And so at one point, there was a female monkey, and I don't know if she was just more intelligent than the others or had, who knows, why this happened, but she started to clean her potatoes. And so she would clean them off in the water and she would eat them. And eventually, she showed all these other monkeys around her how to do it, and pretty soon the entire island of this particular monkey was cleaning their potatoes and eating them and enjoying them. So I think it's a remarkable story, you know, as it is, because it just shows, like, how cool it is that animals can teach one another things. But to make it even cooler, what happened is that once there was a critical mass of monkeys on Koshima who could, who knew how to clean their potatoes, a startling thing happened. And that all these different islands that were far apart, separated from here, but as long as they have macaca, fuscata, monkeys on them, all these other monkeys on these isolated islands started cleaning their potatoes too. So it's as though there was this invisible field of consciousness, and in fact that's what the researchers theorized, that there was some kind of invisible field of consciousness that connected all the monkeys from this one species, and as soon as the critical mass had reached the learning of this one task, it uploaded into this collective, or this invisible field, and all monkeys in that species could connect to that data. So I like to say that this is a scientific explanation, or at least a scientific observance of the collective unconscious. So now our collective unconscious, you know, connects us all um, to this, and there are things within it like symbols and archetypes and different things that we as a species all share. So when we want to think about our dreams, I'm going to go through some different reasons we can have dreams, different mechanisms that might trigger them, but one of them is this idea of underlying conflicts. So as I mentioned before, there are things that we're just not prepared to handle and these get subverted into the unconscious. But if we want to grow and evolve spiritually, we can't leave all this unresolved stuff underneath the surface. And anybody who's engaging in shadow work knows that same thing. There's a reason we're doing it is we're trying to bring stuff up to the surface, right? So dreams are one way that the unconscious can help us see what's underneath. And it's almost like it can sneak its way through. So like there are these things that remember the conscious mind is like almost like that police person, that gate gatekeeper, and they're not allowing these, these memories or the, this information through. But the unconscious mind knows that if it sneaks it through in a different way, it can come into consciousness and maybe it won't be quite as disturbing to us and maybe we could process it that way. So there is this theory that that is one way that dreams work for us. So they, what's interesting though about dreams is that they do consist of day residue, and that can be past residue and future residue, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, because that can lead to precognitive dreaming, or deja vu, or things like that. But backing up, we're just going to talk about past residue and, you know, these internal conflicts. So it could be that when we have a dream, Perhaps part of it is, well, perhaps it's all just internal conflict, right? Rising to the surface, bubbling up so we can pay attention to it. Or maybe it's like those beginning theories that said it was just our way of, our mind's way of working through information, processing memories, things like that. 
or sometimes it can be a combination of both. And I think that most of the time it probably is, which is what makes dreams so crazy and confusing, is because it's not so clear cut. It's not like the message is coming through and telling you exactly what you're supposed to know or need to know. It's like you got day residue from working through it, so maybe why your cousin has showed up in the dream, but then maybe there's unconscious conflicts coming through too, and there could be all different kinds of mechanisms operating at the same time, which is why interpretation can be kind of hard. So, um, on top of that, you know, what I would say is like particularly striking dreams. So, um, Malia had mentioned that her dreams were particularly vivid. And so when the dreams are particularly vivid, it's usually an indication that it's something for us to pay attention to. So those ones that are kind of boring and they pass through, we don't remember much of them, that maybe that is just the brain processing things. But the ones that stick with you, there tends to be something to them that the mind wanted you to know, especially if it nags at you and you just kind of remember it. I had one, a really crazy one with aliens a few weeks ago after I had kind of gone to a place where that was haunted and so I do think there was something I was definitely processing there because I could still remember that dream really well. It still kind of haunts me and nags me a little bit. So those are the ones that we want to really pay attention to and those are the ones that maybe we want to do some dream interpretation of. Um, now especially if there are some striking symbols, like I mentioned the aliens, and I have kind of this, I had a fear of aliens when I was a kid, so if there's something striking in the dream like a symbol, then especially we want to pay attention to those. Uh, because the unconscious mind doesn't use words, it doesn't have that ability to speak in words, it has to speak to us through symbols, which again complicates interpretation. So when we want to interpret, we need to look at the dream on three different levels. So one, we want to look at it from the lens of the conscious mind. So it's literally, what is that thing in the dream? So let's say we have a dream that is very pronounced, it's vivid, it sticks out, it stands out. We know it's something that we um, need to pay attention to. And let's say one of the symbols that is really um, striking in this dream is the moon. So when we look at the, the moon, we look at what is it, the moon. It's a cosmic body in the sky. It's a satellite of the earth. So we look at it at that level. We're right at the conscious level. Literally, what is it? Now, at the unconscious level, we want to go deeper down. And this has to do with your personal unconscious. So you want to look at what does the dream mean to you? Do you have memories of the moon? Does this moon in the dream remind you of something or someone or a place? So we're kind of looking and we're questioning what does this symbol remind us of? What are our own connections to it in our own unconscious, right? And then from the collective unconscious, this is the symbolic stuff, the archetype. So what does the moon mean to the culture or to the species in general or moons are have to do with the tides and spirituality and the feminine, the sacred, um, maybe coolness and um, the, the element of water, the goddess, fertility, uh, mystery, intuition. So these would be like at the collective unconscious level. And so there we are analyzing at three different levels, the conscious, the unconscious, and the collective unconscious. And then from there, you know, we see what we come up with. And hopefully that begins to lend a little insight into what the dream might mean. Now, um, what you can do too is you can ask yourself these three questions as you're analyzing. So you could say, you know, what does the symbol literally mean? Like I mentioned earlier, what does it mean to me personally? And what does it mean to the species? Okay, so those are three questions that we would ask if we're trying to interpret. And this is where, when we're talking about the collective unconscious, or the collective, and we're talking about it from that, that lens, this is where using the dream dictionaries and um, get like any kind of interpretations that are gathered online or in books or different places like that, that's where this can come in handy. But we don't want that to supersede what we ourselves feel about that symbol. So for example, in most dream interpretation, driving, the idea of driving, because we're operating a vehicle, it's about being in control. 
And so when we drive in a dream, it often has something to do with control. Are we in control? Are we out of control? If the, if I, I have one a dream that I often get when I'm very anxious where I, I'm driving, but for some reason the steering wheel won't turn or I can't brake and I'm just helpless. And so generally, because something in my life has led me to be anxious, I'm feeling a bit out of control and there's my unconscious mind trying to play that out in the dream. But on a, uh, if, if I looked into a dictionary, a dream dictionary, and I saw that explanation, if that didn't resonate with me, you know, on the, the, collect, or, um, the personal unconscious level or my personal interpretation of it, I, I wanna, that's why I want to look at it from all these lenses. So I don't want to just blindly accept the things I see in the dream dictionaries. I want to think about it from all of those levels. So um, now, I do want to mention a bit about precognitive dreaming and ways to induce dreaming states and things like that because we are, I know the people who are following me are more spiritual and magical and a lot of you guys are witches and so we want to know how we can work with dreams too. So there are theories that, you know, that you're not going to find this in the science books or anything, but remember I said earlier that just because, you know, we accept one theory it doesn't mean we have to negate all the others. So all of this could be operating at once. And I, I, I generally um, think that most things in life are that way. A lot of times there isn't just one explanation, there's others underneath the surface as well. So when it comes to precognitive dreaming, there are these theorists that believe that we not only do dreams give us present day or past residue or residue that's happening now, but it can also give us future residue. So future residue might show up in a dream. And so in this theory, we are constantly dreaming about future timelines, but only certain ones of these timelines actually come to be. And so when we dream, by some chance, we, we hit on one that will actually be the true future, at least from this perspective or this, this lifetime or this timeline or this dimension or whatever you want to call it. Once we hit on that one, we might experience this as deja vu. So there's one explanation of deja vu is that we are constantly dreaming about future residue and bringing it into our dreams. Um, so, you know, from a more spiritual perspective, ways that we, what we also might experience in our dreams is contact with the ancestors, contact with deceased loved ones, um, contact with people who are maybe they're, they're still in, living in this plane, but they, you were, you're separated from them by many physical miles. So sometimes we will dream of people too, and this can be us actually communicating with them, communicating across the veils or communicating across physical distance. And um, also communicating with future beings. So there are people who have, but have dreamt of their own children before those children were born. And so this idea that you know, these spirit babies or these spirits of these children come to us before, before they actually cross over into this plane. Now there's also ways that we can use dreams to answer questions. So, so maybe we want to um, not necessarily communicate with anyone, but we want to get some answers, maybe answers from our own higher self, perhaps answers from our guides, things like that. And we can actually program our dreams to kind of bring this information through. So I found that um, looking at your dreams critically and closely, especially after a magical working, a ritual, a, um, a divination, so if you had any divination done, a lot of times information will continue to come through to you after the ritual, the working, the divination has been done. And so that's why dreams are very potent places where we can receive these messages afterwards. So I always tell people in my coven, you know, after we've done a meditation perhaps in a ritual or we've done a divination, to watch your dreams for the next couple of days and see what comes through if any of it's relevant to what we did in the magical working because you, your, your own higher self or your guides may be bringing you information through that way, in a way that maybe it can't come through in the conscious, in the conscious world. Um, so we can also seek guidance. So, that, so in those cases I explained there, it was us um, you know, receiving information. So either receiving from the guides, receiving from the ancestors, you know, receiving information about workings we've done, but we can also influence our dreams in some ways. 
So we can set intentions um, on what we would like to dream about. So this works a couple of different ways. So one thing you can do is you can write a question on a piece of paper and place it under your pillow and you can make a conscious effort before falling asleep that you're going to dream about this and you're going to receive an answer to this in some way or that whatever comes through will be considered an answer to the question. So you could do that. You can also repeat a mantra as you try to fall asleep. So perhaps I will remember my dream. That was especially good if you don't normally remember your dreams. But you can also repeat a mantra that's just the question, in fact. So if there's a question you want to know, try to repeat it over and over and over as you're falling asleep. And this will kind of um, program the mind that we want to have some dream work taking place in that, in that dream session. Um, so other ways that we can induce these kind of more um, psychic dream states is working with herbs or working with stones. So stones like the Herkimer diamond is a really good one for dreams, or uh, I love rainbow moonstone, moonstone, labradorite, amethyst is always a great one. Any of the quartzes, any really purple stones, dark blue stones, uh, translucent white stones, all of these are really good for dream work. You can put them around the bed, you can put them under the pillow, you can wear them in jewelry when you're sleeping. And as far as the herbs go, kind of working with er the, the plant allies, so internally you can take valerian if it's an herb that you can handle and that you know will be okay for you. You can take that. It can really create some very vivid dreams in some people. And passion flower is a nice one if you, instead of creating the vivid dreams, let's say you have too many vivid dreams, and sometimes people have too many and they're having trouble sleeping. And so... Um, they uh, can take passion flower. Passion flower will actually calm down the dream state. So it'll be more soothing, peaceful dreams. So those are ones that you can take internally. Now externally, you've got to be a little careful with mugwort. I know that people take it in a tea. Um, so just do research on that if that's what you're going to do. But you could, you could do it externally. Mugwort is a really great herb for dream state, especially psychic dreaming. And so placing the fresh herb around your bed, the fresh, fresh um, mugwort, if you will, or you can also get um, dried mugwort. You can make it into like a little dream pillow that you can put underneath your own pillow or put it somewhere where you can kind of breathe in the scent of it. And uh, actually put it on your eye pillow too. That's another great place. But, the, but mugwort in particular can induce very vivid and sometimes lucid dream states. I also like clary sage, which is a really good one. It's, I like to use it as an oil, and you can use it um, to induce vivid dreams, and it, it'll actually sometimes induce some kind of strange ones too, if that's, if that's what you like. So I'm going to end here um, by talking a little bit about lucid dreaming, and I did have a segment where I talked more about it. It was a few episodes back. It was the episode about the water element. Um, and I was talking about ways to connect to the water element and one of them is through dreams, in particular lucid dreaming. So if you want more information after you hear what I'm going to say here, you can always go back to that episode and I'll probably be talking more about it in the future as well. So lucid dreaming is where we are able to wake up in the dream and we realize that we're dreaming. So we begin to control the dream and we're not beholden by the unconscious mind and whatever it's doing to operate and control that dream. And so there are several ways that we can induce this state. There are some people that are actually just really good at inducing it on their own. And they will easily, they just wake up and they just, they can lucid dream. So not everybody's like that. So if you're somebody who finds ease in it, these, this, these next few minutes, maybe, maybe <laughs> this isn't exactly for you. This is more for those people who are, would like to try to induce it on their own or they have trouble doing it. So for people who are having trouble lucid dreaming or have never done it before and want to try it, we've got a couple of different ways. So my favorite way is through using triggers. And this way, it does, create, it does require that you prepare a little bit in the waking world for a few days, even like a week or two beforehand. And so what you need to do is find a trigger that you are going to um, basically set in the waking world 
in the hopes that you that it gets triggered in the dream world. So this is what I mean by it. So one of the things about dreams is that our appendages tend to look distorted in, for many people, and so it's in particular the hands. And so if you can program yourself to look at your hands several times throughout the day during the waking day, and you kind of look at them and you notice they look normal. So you even you have to think that in your mind too. You want to actually say, oh, my hands look normal. I must be awake. And so you program yourself to do that several times a day. And I would say like have your watch or your phone kind of put an alarm on it. And when that goes off, you look at your hands. Oh, my hands look normal. I'm, I'm, I'm awake. So if you do that for a week, two weeks leading up to this, it's more likely that when you get into the dream state, you will also look at your hands. But when you look at them there, you're going to notice that they are not normal looking. And that is enough to trigger you to wake up in the dream. And once you wake up in the dream, you, the sky is the limit. Then, then you are lucid dreaming and you can control it now. You can do what you want. So other triggers are clocks. Clocks um, are going to be strange in a dream. So if you have a clock around you or a watch or something like that in the waking world, program yourself to look at the watch. Oh, it's 613. It's the time that it is. And that way, if you do that enough, there's a chance that during the dreams, you will also do that trigger and notice that the, the clock is distorted or the face of the watch is distorted, and that will be enough to wake you up in the dream. So I love using the triggers, though, like I said, they do, they do require a little bit of preparation. Another method is through um, trying to induce the state itself before you go to sleep. So the, the method I just told you, you're trying to induce it like within the dream. Here you're going to try to induce it be before you even get there. And so in this case, what you do is what you, you decide you're going to do a session of lucid dreaming. Probably try not to be too, too tired because you don't want to fall asleep inadvertently during this. But when, as you're laying there, you try to remain as rigid as you can without moving. So what happens is that when we are awake, as we're trying to fall asleep, and we're not falling asleep immediately, there's a lot of moving around that we do. And, to, you know, turning to one side, or even just a simple brushing the side of the face, all of this shows the body that we're awake, at least that we're not in a dreaming state. But when we reach the dreaming state, we tend to go rigid physically. And so if you can induce that before going to sleep by just laying there, 15 to 20 minutes is usually what it takes. Some people will say they then feel a heaviness on the chest. Sometimes people hear strange noises. This is an indication that you're kind of moving through that space into, into the dream. And then you... Um, the body basically is tricked into thinking it's fallen asleep while the mind is still awake. And then from there, you're lucid dreaming. So the, the method is, I put it out there, it's a difficult method because like I said, number one, you've got to stay rigid for 15 to 20 minutes, which is kind of hard for a lot of people. And number two, you can't fall asleep or, or you're defeated the point. But it is an option and something worth trying if you're really interested in inducing a lucid dream state. All right, so I am going to see if there's any questions. If anybody has any questions, we've come to the end here. Um, and it looks like there are people who have had some lucid dream states before. Yeah. So it is kind of strange when sometimes, like, we, there will be things in those dreams that we get triggered by that we know can't be true, and that is enough also to wake us up in the dream and, and be lucid dreaming as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a trigger, but um, yeah, but like experiencing someone dying in a dream um, when we maybe we know that they're not actually dead too, that can be enough to kind of wake us up as well. Um, um, or a uh, reverse of that, seeing people that we know have died in the dream but now they're alive can also be a way to trigger us. But just all those unusual things that anything that can um, pretty much trigger us to know that we are not, we are not actually asleep or that we are actually asleep and that we can control the dreams from there. And then I see, yeah, Shauna saying I can't remember my dreams. So one of the things I would 
recommend for anybody who can't remember them is there's a couple of things to think about. One is uh, the bedtime ritual and by and this includes anything that we take to help us sleep. So there are different medications that when taken right near bedtime can make it difficult to remember dreams. So sometimes if you are able to, um, but I take a lot of herbal stuff and what I found is that um, for me, melatonin works. It doesn't work for a lot of people, but it does help with my dreams. Like I can remember them a lot when I'm taking it. Whereas when I'm not, I don't remember them as much. And I also take theanine, which is an amino acid. It calms the body into a dream, like into a sleep state. And to me, that's also helped me remember them. But there are other things I've taken in the past where I don't remember it. I won't remember them at all, especially like medications. There was a medication I was taking for asthma and it just pretty much shut down my dreams. So one thing is to kind of evaluate what you're taking and that doesn't mean to like stop taking things, but at least look at what they are and see if there's anything in them that might be causing you to not remember. And then um, perhaps adding in something that we know does help with dreams. So like valerian, passion flower, any of those herbs I mentioned. And I'll see if I can find some more information too. Um, later this week, I'll post if I can find some more about other herbs. But sometimes that can be helpful. And then the other thing I would mention is trying to kind of program it with uh, some kind of a mantra. Like, I will remember my dreams. I will remember my dreams. Trying to repeat that as you're falling asleep, at least in, the, in a session and experiment and see if it works. It can be a little tedious um, to just repeat that mantra over and over and over again, but you could try it and see if that works. Um, and the, what I would also mention is to put paper and pencil or pen by the bed and have it there because the thing is that sometimes when you will wake up and you're not actually, um, you're kind of half awake, half asleep, if you can write down anything there the, the longer that you stay awake, the more likely it is that you'll lose a dream, especially if it isn't really vivid. So, you know, they say that we all dream and there's some people who remember them and some people who don't. And sometimes people will say, you know, if you don't remember them, doesn't mean you're not dreaming. No, you probably are. Just for some reason, you're, um, it's not coming into the consciousness. So I would try that, try like a dream journal by the bed and, you know, consider maybe valerian can be a good one. And that would be my, um, at least my advice for right now. But like I said, I'll try to find some more information on some more herbs that might help as well. Um, but just really try, try that first, see if you can make a conscious effort to remember them and see if it helps. And then if not, let me know and I'll, I'll come up with some other, some other tips, okay? All right, so if anybody has any other questions, um, yep. Um, oh, you said you had a dream catcher, but you took it down. Oh, okay. Do you take it down for any particular reason? I, I've never really used one, um, so I don't know if that would help to for, to not remember them or to remember them by, but um, Malia says good night. All right, it was so great to have everybody on here, and I will see you next time. Okay, happy waning, give us moon, and I will talk to you soon. Blessed be.